Hello, everyone. Thank you for joining us today. This is Brooke Rouse from the St. Lawrence County Chamber. We have a few more people signing in, but we've got a great uh, group today. This is a hot topic for sure, so thank you for joining us. Um, just so you're aware, your, mukes, your, <laughs> your mics are muted, but you do have the option to type in a question at any time during the presentation, and Rich will respond to your questions at the end of the presentation. But feel free to type them in as they come to mind, and we will address them. If you would like, your screen uh, will have an arrow at the top right corner. If you want to make it full screen, you can do that um, by clicking there. That way you can see some of the details of the presentation. We also want to make sure that you're aware that this presentation is recorded and it will be available for members. We post them all in our member center, which can be found at slcchamber.org. And on the right-hand side, there is a webinar archive. So you can find all of our past recordings there and we'll get this one posted in the next few days. Just wanted to point out on the bottom left, there's a feedback and survey box there. Please plan on um, completing the feedback form if you have to hop off <coughs> early or anything like that and uh, so that we can have a good idea of, of what your interests are for future topics and um, how the presentation went today. All right, we're gonna get started. Great. Thank you. Good afternoon, can you hear me? Yes, Rich, I'm just going to introduce you before you get going. Uh, we, have to, we have with us today Rich Edsel, who was born in Cape Vincent. He has been, uh, he began his insurance career with Prudential in Watertown and worked for Prudential, Prudential Insurance for 10 years and then was recruited to Excellus Blue Cross Blue Shield for five years and subsequently was hired by Benefit Services Group as sales manager. Rich has been sales manager for more than 15 years with Benefit Services Group and is certified by New York State to teach the pre-licensing class for property and casualty insurance agents. Thank you, Rich, for being here today and sharing this valuable information. Take it away. All right. We're going to talk about the Paid Family Leave Act. This will affect every employer in New York State who has one or more employees. The only exception is if you are a governmental agency you and you are not doing statutory disability, then you do not have to participate in this. But if you are a governmental agency and you have chosen to do statutory disability, then you will either have to do this or you will have to send a notice to the workers' comp board and to your insurance carrier more than 30 days before the first of the year to get out of offering paid family leave. But for everybody else, if you have one or more employees, you are in this. Um, and real quick, before I get too far down the road with the slides, if you are a sole proprietor and you're covering yourself with statutory disability or you own the business and you're covering yourself with statutory disability, you would be eligible to participate in the paid family leave as well. But if you do not sign up for January 1st, then you would have a two year waiting period if you decided to do it at a later date. So what is this for? This is basically not for me because I am sick. It does nothing for me if I am sick. I cannot collect statutory disability and paid family leave, okay? The paid family leave is so I can take care of my sick family member or to bond with a child or for military issues as defined under the FMLA. The FMLA, it was only for groups that are 50 or more within a 75 mile radius. So for most of you, you would not be involved in that. But I will make a few comments how the two interrelate as we go through. All right, what's a family member? A family member has been expanded 
and the asterisks are where the expansion has happened as compared to FMLA. So it's going to be my spouse, child, parent, grandparent, grandchild, or domestic partner. And a child is somebody who is biological, adopted, or foster, or legal ward. Uh, if I have a domestic partner there and they're living with me, there's their son or daughter also could be considered a child, right? And parent is really a wide open definition. Anybody who would have been considered to be my parent when I was growing up. And then the grandparent could mean a parent of my, who I perceive to be my parent, and then grandchild and domestic partner. Okay, so what is it going to do besides create havoc in your workplace? Starting on January 1st, eligible employees will be allowed to take eight weeks of paid family leave, and they will be paid 50% of their average weekly wage, and they're going to look back eight weeks on this for most people, to a maximum of 50% of the state's average weekly wage, which is like 1300 and some dollars. So they're gonna draw like 650 max. But then in January of 19, it's gonna go up to 10 weeks of leave and it will pay 55%. Then it's gonna to go to 60% in 2020. Then it's gonna to go to 12 weeks at 67%. And the number one issue here that I see is going to be you meeting your staffing requirements. Because if somebody is out for this length of time, one of the things we're going to get to is you have to A, guarantee their job. So this could become a staffing issue for you, especially if the people who are going to take advantage of this are people who have skills and it's hard to find a replacement in the job market. All right, so who is eligible? On January 1st, when this starts, anybody who has worked for you for at least 26 weeks and they work 20 hours or more on an average regularly, they are immediately eligible to use this on January 1st. But if you hired somebody, say, the 1st of October, they're gonna, they have to meet 26 weeks before they are going to be eligible to take this benefit. Part-time is people who are working less than 20 hours a week, and they need 175 days of employment. And if you notice in here, it doesn't say 175 days of employment in, in a given year. If they've been working for you for 10 years, and they've worked 20 days a, a year for you, they have met it, right? How you're going to track this, that's going to be interesting. So these are people who are eligible, right? And, and again, it's working for you. So um, Mary Smith is working for you, and she's been with you for 10 years, and she's full-time employed. If she leaves March of next year, and she goes to a new employer, she has to start all over again to make her 26 weeks. It doesn't transfer with you as does statutory disability. Remember, if, you, if I qualify for statutory disability with you, and then I leave, and within the first 30 days I'm out, uh, I can collect back on you backwards, not with this. It, you only have this benefit while you are an employee. We'll go. Okay, who's covered, who's not? A public entity, state government, teachers first, that are in the, the county school system or the, the local taxpayer school system, do not have to offer this. If, however, you are offering statutory disability already, you either have to send a letter into the workers' comp board and your carrier saying, I don't want this, or you will have it on January 1st. So you, if you are a public entity and you have statutory disability, you need to do something. If you do not have statutory disability already and you're a public entity, you do not have to worry about it, okay? This will not cover out-of-state employees. This is strictly what state am I physically working in. Now, I can 
I can go out of state and work five days here and five days there or reverse come back into New York State and work five days. But where is my primus, primary workplace location? Not where do I live, but what is my work location? If I belong to a union and the union has already bargained something that is as good or better than this, then they could be exempt. There's a form that has to be filled out. If I have multiple employers, I'm working for Joe Smith today and Mary Brown tomorrow, I'm a part-time in all these places, each place is going to treat me as their employee for this and I would be able to collect from multiple employers, right? So as an employee, it's each place I work. Am I a New York State employee? Yes, I am. Is it exempt because it's a public entity? No, it is not. Then you're gonna, you're gonna end up taking the money out of my paycheck. Um, and again, I've already explained the termination or chains of employers so I'm, I'm a brand new employee and I came to work for you October 1st and, 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 and I'm going to stay with you through February of next year. You're going to start taking the money out and I leave. I don't have any benefit. There's no benefit transferring with me. And by the way, you're going to start collecting money. Do I get that money back? The answer is no. The money does not go back. You can't charge people backwards and they don't get their money back if they leave. Suppose I have a lot of um, part-time people, per diems, whatever you like to call them, and I know they're not going to work. Okay, they're working 20 hours a week or more. I've got a boat marina, and I know they're not going to work 26 weeks. I can give them the waiver and they can sign the waiver, which says that they know they're not going to work this number of weeks. And the waiver is for a given year. And I'm going to explain again the 175 days in a minute. So even though they may have worked for you 13 weeks last year in the summer, and they're working 13 weeks this year in the summer, it, it doesn't count. This is 26 consecutive weeks for somebody who's a full-time employee. So they sign the waiver, which means that the money does not come out of their check, okay? Which means they're not eligible for the benefit. They're entitled to do this. What about a part-time employee working less than 20 hours a week? Maybe it works two days a week for you. They may have had 175 days over the last 10 years, so they could be eligible. But the way the waiver works is do they expect to work 175 days in a 52 consecutive week period. And if they say, well, no, that's not gonna happen, then they also can sign the waiver. You don't collect from them, so they save their $1.60 a week or whatever it happens to be for them. And they're not benefit eligible. I recommend that you consider people who are fitting into these categories as not really 26 week employees or not really they're not going to work the 175 days, is you offer them the waiver so that you don't have to mess around with this. But it's it's your, you. they don't have to necessarily sign the waiver. They would, they're probably never going to get the draw because they're never going to meet the period of time. But I suppose they can give their money to the state if they want. Um, so again, the waiver is only for somebody that you know is not going to meet these requirements. All right, so the employee gets to contribute, and you could have started taking it out June, June 1st, uh, excuse me, July 1st, and the rates are going to be set June 1st of this year, and they weren't actually, but it was close enough. And then in the future years, they're going to be established on September 1st. And I will tell you right now, there is no way that this rate is going to fund this program. If you do the math when you're sitting down, you, you'll figure this out, that this is nothing more than a start to a program, but the money is not there to fund it. Well, where's the extra money going to come from? The extra money is coming from um, New York State, borrowed, cooked, 
whatever term you want to use, money out of the second injury fund, someplace around eight or $10 million that they're using to infuse money into this program. So they probably will make it the first year, but what can you collect from your employees? The rate this year is 0.126% of an employee's weekly wage up to a maximum of the state's average weekly wage wage, which is $1,305.92. If you do this math, it's actually $1.64 and some change, so we took the liberty of calling it $1.65. And that is part of, of Governor Cuomo's press fight. He's going to tell you you're getting this benefit and it's not costing you more than $1.65 a week, which is going to come back in a minute when I explain how you actually collect the money. You could have started collecting it in July 1st, but there was no guidance out from the workers' comp board. Remember, that's where the guidance has to come from. And under the now released guidance, there's guidance from the New York State Department of Taxation, which says that the premiums come out after tax, not before tax. They come out after tax, but the benefit, which is going to be paid by the insurance company, it's coming from the insurance company, it's not coming through your payroll, it's coming from the insurance company, and it will be given to the employee as taxable income. All right? So they're going to get a 1099 from the insurance company if they use this benefit at the end of 2018. Nothing to do with you. You are not, all you are obligated to do is take out this percentage. Now, how am I going to collect it? This has been kicked around three or four times by the workers' comp board, and every time they've given a slightly different answer. The most current answer is you're not going to collect more than $1.65 in a paycheck. There was a notice earlier that said they were going to maybe do it like they did FICA wages, where if a person had a high income, they could maybe get it all paid off early in the year. Uh, I think they got some pressure back from the governor where they want to keep it at $1.65. You do, however, have the right to charge more than $1.65 if you're working with an employee who, let's say, has a small draw for a salary, and then they get bonuses or commissions or something added on to it, say once a quarter, you can go collect that out of that big paycheck. The reason being why is that you have the right during the year, the person's there the entire year and they make enough money and enough money is almost $67,000 a year. You have the right to take $85.56 out of their paychecks for the year. So one of the things you're going to have to pay attention to is that you have a hard stop on this collection, that you do not exceed the $85.56. The reason why is you're going to put this number on the person's W-2, so it's going to be available. Everybody, be, How much did you take out of my paycheck? Well, you took out $92, guess what? I can, I can complain to the workers' comp board because you took out more than you should. So you want to pay attention to that. I assume your payroll company will have this all set for you. How do I pay the insurance carrier? Whoever your disability is with, your New York State disability, the same carrier is going to supply the paid family leave by law. You can't buy it from different carriers. It's all going to be the same carrier. And they're, most of the carriers are going to do this based on volume of premium, uh, payroll that is subject to this premium tax. And that's how you, you so you're going to, you came up with whatever the number was and you multiply by 0.126 and you're going to submit this money. It's almost going to be a self bill for everybody. Um, there might be one or two carriers out there who are doing something different. All right. Now, one of the problems is that the workers' comp board did not get their information out in a timely manner. These are all requirements that are going to be involved, and, and you as the employer are going to need to put a poster up. Well, the posters are not available yet. The, the way this process is being worked through is that your carrier, whoever you happen to have it with, right, guardian, 
shelter point, whatever, is going to be responsible for supplying you with the poster. And you're going to need to post it in every, if you have multiple locations, I have five stores, I have to put it up in each one of those locations. Then you have a handbook or you have an employee manual, I'm not sure what you call it. You're need, going to need to put in language that talks about paid family leave and does it integrate with, let's say I'm a large employer, does it integrate with FMLA or not? You need to be specific about that. Um, and the forms. So I'm, I'm your employee. And by the way, I'm the worst employee you ever had. And, and this is going to come back to haunt you now. So I'm going to come in and I'm going to do a request for paid family leave on January 1st of next year. <clears throat> You're going to need to give me a claim form. And by the way, the claim forms are not approved yet. There was a sample one out on a workers' comp site during the first part of the year, but they have since pulled it back. And they're saying that each insurance carrier has to produce their own form and get it approved by the state. Part of that was because that claim form that they had was not easy to use. It was going to be very difficult. So I'm going to need, I'm coming into you and I'm going to get a claim form. Once I request that claim form from you, you have three business days to get it to me with your part filled out. So you want to make sure that you are aware of that requirement. Then we haven't got into all the different ways I can use this yet, but maybe I'm going to use it for uh, a medical reason to care for my spouse. Remember, it's not for my medical condition. Or I'm going to use it to bond with a child um, or the military exigency requirement, which is similar to the one that on the FMLA. Um, and we've already talked about the waiver. The waiver is not even produced yet. There's one more form that we need to talk about, and that form is you need to give a notice to each one of your employees about the Paid Family Leave Act. And I can tell you right now, as of last week, the Workers' Comp Board had not produced one yet. Um, for our clients, we're going to generate one in the next couple of weeks if the Workers' Comp Board doesn't. Basically, you need to tell the people what it is, what's involved in applying, and how the cost is calculated. All right, so we have several kinds of leave that I can request. One is a foreseeable leave. The easiest one of these to talk about is, I'm going to have my knee replaced. We know for sure, right? And the doctor says he's going to do it on February 15th. So I come in, I give you, I have to give you 30 days notice because that's a foreseeable event. If I don't give you 30 days, the insurance company has the right to short my payments by up to 30 days based on how many days notice didn't I give you, okay? So a planned medical treatment is one, you know, we all know this is going to happen. Or birth or placement of a child. Childbirth is pretty well within the, the realm that they pick. And the military, if it's known, which may or may not be, a lot of times the government does something overnight and, and the people have to react quickly so it's a not a foreseeable event. My mother has a heart attack in Florida. That's a not a foreseeable event. So I'm going to notify you as soon as practical, which might be the next day, could be the same day, could be a couple business days later. It could all depend when it happens. There is no advance notice to the carrier required for events that are not foreseeable. Okay, so here's what happens. Um, remember I said I was your worst employee? Well, I'm going to get my wife diagnosed with seasonal depression syndrome, which is a serious condition, and I'm going to have to take her to Florida. Now, to be able to take leave, I have to be with the person. She, my wife can't be in Florida and I'd be here. That's not going to work. Um, and, and in that particular case, that would be a foreseeable one because I get her diagnosed and I say, well, I'm going in January and February. And I'm going. That's eight weeks. 
Life is good. And I can take it in a block. Or I can choose to take paid family leave. I'm going to take my grandmother for chemotherapy every Thursday. I'm going to take her in the morning. I'll be done in an hour. And I get the rest of the day myself. Why? Because I get to take a full day of leave. I cannot take a part of a day of leave. Under paid family leave, the increments a full day. For those of you familiar with FMLA, those are much smaller increments. They can be down to like as low as 15 minutes, perhaps, based on your time clock situation. So here, this is going to require me to take the entire day, even though I only need an hour to take Granny to the doctor. All right. What I'm going to tell you now is, if you are a group that is large enough, meaning 50 or more employees within a 75 mile, hour, 75 mile radius, you need to fix your handbook, your employee manual that says that you are going to integrate paid family leave and FMLA leave as well whenever they will go together. It will not go together all the time. For instance, under paid family leave, I can do child bonding. I'm going to bond with my child. I can do that as daily increments. I can do one day this week. I can take every Friday off for 40 days. Under FMLA, I can't. It has to be in a block. So there are some differences there. All right. Um, so you want to make sure that you are looking at your handbook or your, your personnel file so you've made it clear to your employees what they can do or not do. All right. So paid family leave can run with FMLA. You cannot receive paid family leave and DBL at the same time. They are mutually exclusive. So um, Mary Jones has a baby. In the past, she's gone out on DBL for six weeks or eight weeks, and she's got half of her salary up to a $170 maximum. Now, she's going to look at this paid family leave and see that if she bonds with the child and is no longer disabled, she can take time off and get paid 50% the first year for eight weeks, but up to a higher number, right? She could make 600 and some dollars. So Mary's going to figure this out right away and say, hmm, I think I'm going to stay home and bond with my child. The bond, or, or it could be the same for the father. The bonding leave could cause a problem for you. Let's say that you are a financial institution and you have tellers and you happen to have four or five tellers and they're all pregnant with the same or close to the same due date. Well, here's what has to happen is you can't deny them paid family leave. When they have the child, they can choose when to bond. They, they can't use it if they're disabled in collecting um, statutory disability. But after, as soon as they're off that, they can say, you know, the child's born, I don't want any more DVL, I'm going to go on paid family leave. And all you can do is say, yeah, here's the form. And especially when you're four years down the road under this plan, and they get 12 weeks at 67%, when you add in child care to that, they're farther ahead to stay home. So this is one of the things you're going to need to think about is how am I going to fill the employee's space because they have to guarantee their job. And, they, and in the first year, they could get up to eight weeks to do bonding leave. And this is, they get to look backwards. They have to use those eight weeks within 52 weeks of the date of the birth of the child or the date of the adoption or the foster placement. So we want to be you want to you want to be thinking about how how am I going to cover you know my bank teller line or my drive-through window or whatever it is if I have a large population that might be taking bonding leave. Bonding is the one that you know is going to happen 
and the people probably will take the full extent of it. With regard to taking medical leave to care for somebody else in my family, my mother, my father, my wife, whatever, that may or may not happen. <laughs> if spouses work for the same employer, then only one of them gets to take bonding leave at the same time, unless the employer wants to say, no, you both can have it at the same time. If they are working for different employers, they both could take it at the same time. But I'm thinking a lot of spouses are going to take, spouse A is going to take it for their eight weeks, then spouse B will take it for their eight weeks, and they got 16 weeks of babysitting that they've taken care of. Um, and if, by the way, if, if you have some kind of paid time off, we're going to need to talk about that. Because are you going to allow your employees to raise that 50% to 100% of their salary by, by turning back in paid time off, vacation time, that kind of thing? <clears throat> Again, the birth has to be taken with 52 weeks of the date of the birth. So that means if, if somebody has a child now, they're eligible to do paid family leave in 2018. So do you have people out right now who have had children? And guess what? They will be eligible for this. You need to take it into planning um, your strategy of how you're going to have bodies in all the departments you need them in. Now, here's the, here's the big one. When I come back from taking paid family leave, I'm entitled to return to the same or comparable position without losing any benefits they would have otherwise accrued. And what this means is, if I was working the 3 to 11 shift, and I come back and you say, well, I don't, that shift is full now, but I can put you on the 11 to 7 shift, I can go to the state workers' comp board, complain, or go to the labor department and complain, and you are most likely, as the employer, going to lose and you're going to have to figure a way to get me back out to that 3 to 11 ship. So you need to, when you're planning this out, they're basically entitled to leave today, take up to eight weeks off for paid family leave, come back to the same position. That's assuming that they qualified, and based on the earlier slide where you have, I work for you 26 weeks at 20 hours or more, or 175 days at less than that. And if you offer health insurance, you have to continue the employee's health insurance during their paid family leave and pay the same thing as if they were physically working and they pay you the difference. Now this doesn't mean that they can take eight weeks and, and stiff you for their portion because there's a provision that you can, basically you wait for 30 days for them to pay you like you would handle COBRA then you give them a letter saying in 15 days, if you haven't paid me, we're canceling the retroactive back all the way to the first of this. And you're entitled to do that. All right. Now, denied claims. I want you to think about this a minute. Again, this is not me getting a form from my doctor. With a, with a case of childbirth, that's pretty simple. There's going to be a birth certificate. And it's going to have the mother's name on it, and it's going to have my name on it. If it doesn't have my name on it, in a case where we're talking about a child that was just born, it's not my child. We can do whatever we want to do, but unless I go to court and get DNA samples, my name's not on the birth certificate, right? With placement with a child, my name would be on the adoption decree or on the foster placement, whatever. So that's a pretty simple. Here's the birth certificate I'm on here. I want to, it's, and then you look and you see the date and you say, yeah, you're within your 12 months to do this. I'm going to take my paid family leave and babysit the kid. And, 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 I, and I'm only going to take every Friday off and I'm going to put the kid in a backpack and take him golfing or whatever it is I do. Maybe he wants to go fishing. So there shouldn't be denied claims for stuff like paid family leave. They should be able, the employee should be able to give the advance notice. There should be no question about it. Um, there's a child or there's not a child. There's a birth certificate. That's what you do. You fill out your portion of the claim. You give the claim form to 
the person, they attach a copy of their birth certificate, they send it into the um, insurance company, and life is good for them. And you have to find a replacement worker who's going to work for eight weeks with no guarantee of a future job. Here's the thing. Your obligation is to give them the claim form. My advice to you is you give them the claim form within the three days it's filled out and you do not do anything else for them. You do not call the insurance carrier. You do not call their doctor. You don't do anything. You will receive a notice from the carrier when the claims approved or when the claims denied and you will know. And we're going to talk about that a little bit more when we get into medical claims. You need to stay out of this because if you get in the middle of this, the only thing that can happen is bad stuff can happen and you could end up with um, a complaint being filed against you with the uh, Department of Labor. So, you, so this is really simple. My advice is you give them the claim form, they have to mail it to the carrier. It is their obligation. You stay out of it. Period. All right, what's a denied claim? Well, all right, I'm going to go take care of my mother in Florida because she had a heart attack, whatever. Now, I physically have to go there. I've got to be with her. Well, I get down there, and her doctor is going to have to fill out some paperwork that's going to go to the insurance company. Well, before the doctor will do anything, I've got to get a HIPAA form signed by my mother, who may or may not want to sign the HIPAA form. She may tell me to go back home. But if I'm going to be there to help her, she's got to, I've got to get a HIPAA form signed. Then I've got to get that doctor to fill out their portion of the claim form. And I see this as a huge problem. Um, major hospital in Jefferson County does not have time right now to barely fill out the forms for FMLA. Now the state is going to dump all these additional claims on top of them. And by the way, they don't get paid by the insurance company to do this. So they may ask you, the employee, not you the employer, but you the employee to pay for these. Um, otherwise, they may take two, three, four, five weeks to fill these out and send them in. The doctor in Florida could look at this and says, huh, I moved out of New York State. I don't like it. I'm not filling out any claim form for them and throw it in the basket. So I see there could be some issues for this if the person that you are trying to take care of as the employee is out of the area, especially if they're out of the state. So what are you going to do? So, the, so what's going to happen is the insurance company has 18 days from the date that the claim is complete to render a ruling that, yes, this is a legitimate claim or no, it's not. So I think there's going to be a lot of claims that are going to be technically denied because the, they're not complete. And once they get completed, they will then go through the process with them. So it just happens to be opening a trout season, whatever you want it to be. And I want to go trout fishing and I don't have any time off. And you said to me, you're not going to let me just take an unpaid day. Well, I'm going to find some sick person in the family. I'm going to call up with an emergency. Remember, I said I was the worst employee I ever had. And now I'm going to file this paid family leave claim. Well, I know it's going to take like 18, 21 days before you're going to get a response. And I'll be back to work before then. And life will be good. I'll just have gone without pay for those days. That is a concern that I have. Is Are people going to try to work the system? My advice to you is that unless they have committed fraud, do not terminate them. Because I don't think you'll have a just termination. I think you will lose on that. If they've committed fraud, then you can terminate them. Now, again, the maximum benefit that I can draw between DBL, <coughs> excuse me, and paid family leave is 26 weeks in a 52-week period. Um, that. You know, there is no argument about that. That is the law. So you can offer, you the employer can say to your employee, I will let you use vacation personal leave to raise that 
from 50% to 100%. Receive full salary. But you cannot make them do that. All right? So you can offer it to them. You cannot make them do it. Under, pay fam, uh, under FMLA, you can make them do it. Not in this case. This is strictly, would you like... Mr. Jones, would you like to have your salary be at 100000 and we'll, we'll turn in your vacation time at a half a day every time you have a day of, of um, paid family leave? And Mr. Jones could say yeah or no, and that's what you're stuck with. I cannot think of a reason you wouldn't want to let them do that because you'd want them to use up their vacation time, whatever. Otherwise, I've taken off eight weeks to babysit my child. Now there's four weeks I'm going to take off for vacation or three weeks or two weeks. And I'm not sure that you're going to want me to take additional time off. So we've already been through. The, the medical certification, I feel, is the biggest issue here. You, the health care provider has got to provide it. Right now it's for free, and I don't see him doing that. What's the date cons that this thing began for the medical certification? Like, when did my mother have her heart attack? How long is it going to last? How long is she going to need me? Certification of the patient's health condition. And in some cases, there's an estimate of the frequency and the duration required leave. Now, one of the things is maybe you have a child who's an asthmatic and it's the asthma is not really controlled. That would fall into the situation. So I might wake up one morning and have to take my child to the emergency room. That would be considered suitable for a paid family leave day. And that would not require advance notice. Now, if I'm that parent, I could do an advance notice the first of the year and send all this information in about my child that is an asthmatic so that if I need to take a day off for them, I could take that day and get paid for it relatively easily. Um, or somebody else with some other type of a, a condition that comes and goes like that, but that is really life-threatening. And again, if this is all on the employee, if the employee does not produce the information, they don't get paid, they don't have an approved time off. But you haven't paid them either, so it's not like the end of the world, they just haven't shown up to work. So, what is a serious health condition? Illness, injury, impairment, physical condition, a mental condition? Um, if I'm in a hospital or I'm in a hospice or a residential care facility or continuing treatment or continuing supervision, somebody with Alzheimer's would fit into this category. Um, and what's continuous? Three or more continuous days unable to work. The exception to this would be something like uh, an uncontrolled diabetic or uncontrolled asthmatic because they, one day they may, may only miss a day at a time, but they're always under the care of a healthcare professional. That's how they get by. Um, so I can't go to school. I can't do my job. That would, that's the, again, it's not for me. It's for whoever we're talking about, my spouse or whatever. Chronic health condition. Continues over a period of time, um, asthma, diabetes, epilepsy. Now, I remember I told you I was that really rotten employee. So I do have an asthmatic kid, in my example. And I was out bowling last night, and it was a late night, and I really shouldn't have had stayed at the bowling alley until 3 in the morning. Um, I'm going to probably report my kid having an asthma attack. And the thing is, I may not end up taking the doctor, so I may be able to skate by. What I'm trying to say to you is this system has a lot of potential flaws in this. You are going to rely on the honesty and integrity of your employees. Um, again, long term, I have somebody has a stroke, their terminal stage of a disease. What this is, was designed for is somebody who's undergoing uh, chemotherapy, they need constant care, those kinds of things. But what, because of the way the law was written, there's a lot of holes in it. Um, and again, they can't do their daily activities. Um, they've had surgery. They're, they're incapacitated for more than three days. 
severe arthritis, they're going to physical therapy, they got kidney disease, dialysis. These all would, would be ones that once they did the paperwork, they could possibly take off days intermittently. And again, you need to understand that here you can use intermittent to even take care of your bonding with your child. Again, you must be close to the person in that you're going to you're going to be able to provide care. You can't phone it in. You have to be able to bring them their meal tray or do whatever or transport them. Or you have to be there when the doctor comes. Something like that that you are involved in their daily activities. If you are not, it doesn't count. And the military ones, they're following the same ones or FMLA um, and these are pretty standard out there. There is there is nothing here that's that's really a surprise. All right, here are some resources that you can go to. You can go to either the um, government, New York State government, or you can go to the Workers' Comp Board. I just want to highlight a few items. I want to remind you that it's your obligation as the employer to give everybody a notice prior to the end of the year and or before the start of the year I should say and I also um, want to make sure that you understand that your obligation is to give them the claim form in three business days and they send it to the carrier and you rely upon information coming back from the carrier so you need to stay out of this i cannot emphasize that anymore now we have a couple questions here statutory disability is required for all non-governmental employers in new york state who have one or more employees and you're buying that from some insurance carrier or you've gone to the you're doing it through the state um, carrier of last resort um, so if you have disability insurance in place you are going to be doing this if you don't have disability insurance in place and you have employees and basically the rule is you have to have an employee for at least 30 days out of the year 30 consecutive days but if you qualify and you don't have statutory disability, sooner or later the Workman's Comp Board will um, kick down your door and you'll be fine. So you want to make sure you're set up there. Um, the payments to the employee subject to FICA, Medicare, and Social Security. Uh, the answer on this is going to be probably not, but the feds have not ruled on this at all. But because the money is being taken out after tax, you've already paid the FICA on the premium. So therefore, it is my opinion that the payment should be exempt from everything except for state and federal taxes. What's in uh, Okay, the question was, can I repeat the employer response an employee not paying their health insurance. All right, so I'm going to do this, and I'm going to put in for bonding time, and I'm going to take the whole eight weeks at once. So you know I'm going to be out for eight consecutive weeks. You have to continue my insurance, and you have to pay your same share what you were paying. So let me keep this simple and say I owe you $200 a month. I owe you then $200 for the first four weeks, and we're cheating and saying there's four weeks in a month and 200 for the second, all right? I did not pay you that first $200. And it's the end of 30 days. You have to give me the 30 days to pay you. And in that case, I didn't pay you. You're gonna send me a notice. It has to be a 15 day notice. And what you're gonna say is that effective, whatever the date is, November 15th, I'm canceling your health insurance back to October 1st unless you remit the $400. And if you need help with that, reach out to Nicole or myself through the email, and we'll get back to you specifically one-on-one. -on -one. If this is a reason, though, why you may want to let the people take their vacation time or pay time off, because now you can take that insurance premium out of the check, and you don't have to worry about this. Uh, 
uh, copies of the slides, I think, are going to be all on the St. Lawrence County website. Um, okay, if you have a union contract that does not, this is a question about PFL negotiable and union contracts. The answer is, if you don't specify paid family leave in your current union contract, then you are subject to this. Then you could negotiate in something else in the future, and as long as it's as good or better than paid family leave. But you could, some union may already have this built in. If you already have the benefit built in and it's as good or better, you can go to the to the workers' comp board and ask for an exception. You have you have to do something. You can't just say, "Oh, it's as good or better," and I'm not going to fill out the I'm not going to buy this thing. You can't do it that way. Um, so, and I want to point out to you one thing: I that not I told you that governmental entities did not have to participate in this. And that's at this time. The governor right now is holding meetings with unions. He is trying to get the unions to go along with making all the state employees come into this as well. There is not enough money to fund this system so that down the road, you, the employer, are probably going to get stuck with paying this because you can't do this for $85 a year. It will not, right? I could draw. Um, five grand roughly if I'm paid enough and, and, and putting in $85. No way this is going to work. And, and the government is not going to ding the people 10 or 15 bucks a week. So who is it going to come back to? You need to plan for it in four or five years. If this stays the way it is, it's going to come out of the employer's pocket. Uh, confused on the math percentage of 0 0.126 on the slide. That That is the maximum, the 130592. Comes out to be a dollar sixty-four thirty-five. Everybody rounded it to a dollar sixty-five. What they're saying is that the that you're going to take point uh, one two six of the person's earning, but you're going to stop at a buck sixty-five. Hopefully, I've answered that question. Any other questions? Well, we I believe that. Uh, hang on. If you have any other questions, you can reach out to myself or Nicole. Um, there is Nicole's email address. And we are happy to get back to you. Again, I want to tell you that you will get in trouble if you try to get too involved in the day-to-day -day activities of this paid family leave. Your obligation is to give them the claim form, to give them the notice about this stuff, to make sure that your personnel manual is all right, or that um, if you have a handbook, whatever you have is all right. If you have an SPD for your health insurance, you need to reference it in there. You want to make sure that you've referenced it, and then you stay out of it. Because if you get in the middle of this, and then you use something you've learned to terminate somebody, you're rehiring the person and paying all their lost wages and probably some fines. So don't do it. Thank you very much for your time. Have a great day. Thank you, Rich. That was extremely informative and certainly take note of Rich's contact information and follow up with him. We will make the presentation available on slcchamber.org so you can check that out in uh, recording form. Um, I do want to thank Laura Perry from Clarkson for uh, hosting us on her platform and for St. Lawrence University for sponsoring this series. We appreciate uh, their time and expertise and um, wanted to just point out that uh, next month we will again meet for our monthly webinar on the first Wednesday and um, the topic next month is navigating workman's comp. So hopefully you will join us on November 1st. Please take a minute to uh, complete the feedback form there on your screen. And also let us know if there are any other topics you'd like to hear about or if you would like to present a topic. We would appreciate it. Thank you, everyone, for joining us. Thank you again, Rich. And um, hopefully you found this informative. And feel free to look back at the recording. It's a lot of information. Have a great afternoon, everyone.